Now, Lincoln was emerging as a leader of the Republican Party in the late 1850s. And remember, the Republican position on slavery was contain it where it already exists. The Democrats, led by Douglas, their position, as we've learned, was popular sovereignty. Let the people in the new states decide if that state's going to be slave or free. Now, Lincoln's goal in life was to make a mark, to do something for which he would be remembered. And he thought he had a good chance of doing that if he could become a U.S. Senator. He had served one term in the House of Representatives back in the 1840s. So in 1858, he's going to challenge Douglas for the one of the two Senate seats in the state of Illinois, and they will have seven debates. Uh, in those debates, here's a point that Douglas often made regarding Lincoln. Now, this is a pretty good point made by Douglas. Lincoln was on record as being against slavery. That was very clear. And so Douglas took it a step further. If Lincoln is opposed to slavery, he must also support racial equality. Lincoln must believe that if they're not going to be slaves, then they're going to have all the same rights that uh, the white majority population has. Now. Lincoln's going to be forced to respond, and uh, I put one of his responses on your study guide for you to read on the chapter Liberalism and Lincoln, so make sure you do that, and uh, here's the gist of Lincoln's response. clearly states that at this time, he doesn't support racial equality. And he says that the former slaves will not vote. They won't be able to serve as jurors. And uh, this is a big issue at the time. They will not be allowed to intermarry with the right white race. And so, as you can see from the study guide and from what I'm telling you now, uh, this statement is uh, easily interpreted as a white supremacist statement. Now, I will add that if you read it, Lincoln chooses his words carefully, and uh, it does not mean that he might not change his mind or hold a different position later. Now, in 1858, you have to remember that uh, you could probably take all the people in the United States that believed in actual racial equality and maybe put them in Marian Auditorium, uh, even without, even with some social distancing, to put it into our terms of our day. And so Lincoln was not unusual, and the people in his crowd that were listening, they would have shared the same views. Simply to be against slavery in 1858 did not mean that you favored equality of the races. So I think Douglas was making a great point here. If they're not slaves, what are they going to be? If they're not going to be equal to white people, there must be some middle ground somewhere. What is that? A new category. Now, just to make sure that we remember this, but, 
by 1864. Lincoln is moving toward racial equality. Now, uh, for example, uh, I just finished the, the latest biography on Abraham Lincoln, and in that biography I learned that uh, as early as 1864, Lincoln is corresponding with officials in Louisiana, and Louisiana is in the process of uh, being restored as a state in the Union even before the war is over. And in those letters, in that correspondence, he is suggesting that on a gradual basis, the former slaves be given the right to vote. And in so doing, he becomes the first president to ever openly suggest that uh, former slaves should have the right to vote. So his position from 1858 is not where he ends up in life. So these debates play a major role in propelling Lincoln to a more national uh, following and uh, more notoriety on a national level. Here's number two. So in 1860, Lincoln's going to be invited to come to New York and give a speech at a church. Now, as he's traveling on the train, uh, they decide that he needs to be in a larger place, so he's going to speak at Cooper Union instead of the church. Before he left, what Lincoln did was examine the voting records of the men who signed the Constitution. He tracked it down, he did his research, and determined how they voted when it came to the expansion of slavery. He also went to a tailor in Springfield and ordered a brand new suit for which he paid $100, which would be like paying, you know, a thousand or more dollars for a suit today. When he got to New York, he went to Matthew Brady's studio and had his photograph taken. And later on in life, he'd say two things made me president. Matthew Brady's photograph and my speech at Cooper Union. Now, Lincoln was sort of new to Easterners, and at first when he got up there, they thought he looked uh, kind of strange. His clothes didn't fit quite right, and uh, they happened to be wrinkled from his traveling, that type of thing. But when Lincoln began to speak, here's the thesis of his speech. Now, I'll give you a couple of moments uh, to write that down in your notes. So when Lincoln did his research prior to going to New York, what he discovered when he examined the voting records of the 30 plus men who signed the Constitution, later on, when they had an opportunity, they voted, the majority of them voted to contain the spread of slavery. Now, why was this important? 
This was the current Republican position. So what Lincoln and the Republicans were saying is, we got to get back to what the founders thought that uh, slavery isn't going to be around here forever. And the federal government does have the right to contain the spread of slavery. And as we've learned, that precedent was set with the passage of the Northwest Ordinance in 1787. Now, if you look at this, if uh, the Republicans came to power, what they could do is put an end to popular sovereignty because they could say that a new state was going to be period free. It would also do away with uh, the ruling in the Dred Scott decision because if the federal government had the power to contain the spread of slavery and could say that a new state was going to be a free state, then you could not bring slaves into that state. And so these were two of the things in uh, 1858, the Lincoln-Douglas debates and the Cooper Union speech, which helped to bring Lincoln into the national spotlight.